Greetings, nerds. This is Cena Nerd. I'm your host, Sarah Belmont, and with me, as always, is our Mr. Producer, Will Polk. How are you doing tonight, Will? I'm doing very well, Sarah. Uh, this is the, the last night of Sharknado. I don't know if anybody's watching it. Somehow, I, I, I forgot that it was on <laughs> until just now. <laughs> what? Wait, wait, wait. Why are you so, like, ashamed of that? Well, I, I've invested in the first five so oh I, I feel like I need to watch them for sex, but somehow the email came and, and, and went, and I, and I didn't watch it. But I know it'll be on multiple times on the Sci-Fi channel, so I will just catch it, catch it at some point this week. Yeah, and meanwhile, I will be looking for a new co-host. <laughs> um, you can tweet me. <laughs> <laughs> you ne- never disclose Sharknado. Like, like, why, Will? Why would you start a recording like that? I'm just gonna tell the whole world about my secret obsession with Sharknado. NATO. Does that really sound like a good idea? Um, there's a lot of nerds out there that like sh- like Sharknado. So, <sighs> <laughs> I know you're not one of them. I know you're in the camp of why is this even a thing but i missed it yeah i don't like i think sharknado like it it came out right when i moved down to juno and Mm. that's when i stopped having a tv and so then i just missed it and it was never on for me to randomly watch and then get sucked into yeah but it's also just really dumb it is it is it's like the perfect like brain candy not even brain candy it's just uh, yeah, it's it's the perfect thing to you know end in in the week with, and uh, also you know as far as like Discovery Channel always has Shark Week and stuff. You know, you gotta have you know you close out your office with with, with Shark Hater. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm discovering a lot of brain candy, which I don't know if we're using that term correctly. I blame you personally, Will. Um. <laughs> I discovered my own brain candy on Netflix. I they are really um, creating the like finding their niche in mm-hmm. this original content in terms of romantic comedies. Yeah, because I've I've only watched all the boys I've loved before at least five times this weekend. Oh well, I haven't memorized. <laughs> um, yeah, and and it's it's hard because I would totally have a crush on the lead actor, except he's a bit younger than me. <laughs> uh, Sarah's a cougar. <laughs> but, you, but you know what? Okay, so we talked a few weeks back with Patricia. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Patricia. We miss you. And we were talking about the romantic comedies. And, right. like, I, I despise the kissing booths. Mm-hmm. Um, set it up w- was a little bit better, and this past one just nailed it. It's exactly what I remember watching when I was in high school. Okay. So, and it's based off of a book. Right, right. I've heard of it, and I I saw that it was uh it was I guess it dropped this weekend. Yeah, it yeah. dropped this weekend, and the crazy thing is, they're doing another one next month called um. Oh, it's it's something Sierra Burgers like everyone hates Sierra Burgers, mm. Burgers or something. But it's um with a this actress who played in Stranger Things. Okay. She was the girl who gets um goes missing in the first season. Oh yeah, Barbara. Barb. Barb, Barb, Barb yeah. 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 So so that actress like she, she recently appeared in Riverdale and now she's doing this movie. So she's creating like her own little path, mm. which is really cool. That is cool. Um, but I was, I was just thinking about it this weekend that, you know, Netflix original content, they're never going to be able to do blockbuster movies like tentpole filmmaking and, and even indies for some reason doesn't, um, doesn't really transfer over well in my opinion, because it still feels like a straight to straight to DVD movie. And it just has this gloss on it. That's weird right but i do think that if they continue down this path in terms of like that teen drama angst they could create their own niche and and it fits like it's not straight to dvd but it's also it's like that television tv movie feel 
Yeah. 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 I don't know. It's interesting. It's it's getting to that point in hiatus. Yeah. Another thing I was considering, Will, like we we had it good for so long. We did. Dagger. We did. It was spoiled, and now it's even beyond Comic Con, where we know what's ahead for Flash and Arrow and all of our favorite comic book TV shows. Mm-hmm. But we're still not even like a month out. Yeah. It's so far away. It, it feels. feels like. It does feel like it's very far away. Uh, and and there are some things, like, that are going to be uh, premiering shortly. Like, um, we have Jack Ryan on Amazon. We do have The Gifted returning to Fox. But even that's still about a month away because it's not until what, September 22nd. Um, yeah. And we have uh, – we, but we do have something that we didn't watch the very first season of. Uh, but their season two is a coming shortly, which is Iron Fist two. Yeah, and the first trailer I didn't really care for of Iron Fist two. Yeah, I really like the second trailer. Yeah, it I, I liked it as well. It was one where I really I was like, oh, uh, <laughs> this you have me intrigued. <laughs> you, you you yeah you got me you know. I might step in, step into your office here for a moment because, uh, <laughs> because again, you know, I didn't watch season one. I don't, uh-huh. did you ever watch it? Oh yeah. Okay. I, I drank that Kool-Aid. Yeah. You drank, yeah I guess you listen, I, you listen to our friends, Carrie and Everett, and did you, yeah, cause I know they were, our friends over at Geeks Talk TV were all over our business. I do. Oh, they love it. Yeah, yeah. I hated it. <laughs> and <laughs> but my my introduction to Danny Rand was uh, in the Defenders, right? And I was underwhelmed, um, mm-hmm. uh, even though they really tried very hard to build this character up and, and the and the Defenders. And it, there were I, mean, I can't be completely negative. I mean, it, there were some points in there that he was intriguing, but um, it still didn't work, but I think Luke Cage season two, uh, helped to solidify that relationship between Luke and Rand Industries and, you know, building this universe and this trailer that dropped. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it looks good. They, they really did a great job of selling the story. Uh, making Danny look uh, like a come into his own as a as a hero. Um, it, uh, it of course has our you know we get to see Misty Knight show up uh, in mm-hmm. the in the trailer, which uh, again you know reestab you know again connects this universe to the you know our Netflix universe of Marvel shows, um, and, and it just looks like you know, with Davos as the uh, Phil Serpent just looks like a badass villain. So, so it's interesting. Um, the first season, a lot of it's forgettable, mm-hmm. and they had a horrible villain. Nobody really cared about the Mation Mation family. I can't even pronounce their their last name. That's how forgettable they are. Mm-hmm. But I do remember Davos, mm-hmm. and he does appear in the first season a okay. little towards like he kicks off the third act of the season. Okay. And I remember being very intrigued with his character because he brought something new to Danny Rand, um, a history and more about um, Con Lu and that heritage that mm-hmm. Danny's very proud of. So I that's why I gravitated towards this trailer. Um, I think they made the smartest decision they could, and they really – said, you know what, we told Danny's origin story the best we could. We talked about who Danny Rand is, and now we're going to really bring out the Iron Fist and talk about that story and how it's connected to this relationship with Davos. And, of course, you have the classic villain who's the opposite of your hero, mm-hmm. and but they have the same power set. And yeah. those are always the best, best villains that yeah. these characters usually have. Yeah. So when you were talking before um, 
I, I find that Danny works best when he really does have a good on-screen partner. Mm-hmm. Um, he can fall flat when it's just him and he's out and about and he's, I don't know, we're just following him around. But if he doesn't have anybody to bounce off from, because I think he worked well in on the Defenders with Luke Cage, of course, yeah. and also his interactions um, with Daredevil, um, because mm-hmm. there was such a similarity between these two characters, right. but they're immediately put at odds, and I thought that was a really smart choice as well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much sold on the second season. They can't do any worse than the first season, yeah. so they have that going for for them, so so would so far, listeners who haven't watched um, season one, is it worth? No. Going, okay. No, it, it really isn't. I I think that if if I was a writer on season two, I know that season one didn't work for most most viewers. And so if I'm going to have the trailer sell you on watching season two, I'm probably going to add in a few notes about what happened in the season, first season in those first few episodes. Mm-hmm. So new viewers won't get lost, but they won't have to go back and sit through 13 episodes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for saving me time. <laughs> yeah, but you're a completist, so you're probably going to do it anyway, like behind my back. No, no. I, no, I'm, no, I'm still working on other other things that I promised you, so I, I will not. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and in other news, Ethan Peck got cast as Spock in Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, yeah. It uh, was earlier this week. Uh, we were told during uh, right, right around San Diego Comic Con that Spock was going to be uh, in his uh, relationship with uh, Michael Burnham, who is his adopted sister, um, was going to be explored in season two of Discovery. So, just to roll back a little bit so for for folks uh, who are not Star Trek fans. Uh, so Star Trek Discovery is, uh, one of the flagship programs on the uh, relatively new CBS All Access, uh, streaming service. Um, uh, it, uh, had a very strong first season overall. And at least in my opinion, I, I'm, granted, I'm, I'm a bit biased, but, uh, but I try to be honest when I, when I give reviews. Um, the, yeah, so, the the series is set about ten years before the original uh, Captain Kirk time um, five year mission. So it's in the original timeline. It's not the new timeline that's in the in the movies and uh, the current crop of movies with uh, Chris Pine for now. Mm-hmm. Um, it, at the very end of season one, uh, we uh, the uh, inter spoiler alert. The crew of the Starship Discovery encounters the crew of the Starship Enterprise under the command of uh, Captain Chris Pike, who was the uh, uh, preceding commanding officer before James C. Kirk. And long-time Star Trek fans will know that uh, Spock served on the Enterprise for many years before uh, James C. Kirk became captain. So that will set us up for Season 2. Apparently... Uh, there uh, is going to Spock and, and Michael Burnham, who is uh, played by Sonequa Martin, um, who, from, who is his adopted sister. Um, who will there will be some tension there that will um, you know be present. And for me, I you know this is the third actor, obviously, who's played Spock. Obviously, Leonard Nimoy started. You know, it was the first one. Uh, Zach Requento and the um, movies has been Spock taking a new take on the character, you know, but as, at its core still preserves that Vulcan, uh, um, you know, quote unquote control of emotion because Vulcans do have emotions. But this will be interesting to see this new, this new version because I, I, I'm interested to see how Spock will be tr- he will 
interact with the human crew and that will he be like uber Vulcan where he is, you know, super logical and, you know, the things that we, uh, you know, typically think of Spock as far as being cold, no emotion and, and how he's going to interact with, with, the, with Michael and also how they're going to treat this as far as in the canon, because obviously we've had, you know, 50 plus years of, no mention of this sister, and now all of a sudden we have her. And so, uh, I'm very intrigued for season two. And I think, I think they're going to, uh, kick up the action even more in season two. And, um, I, I you know, they, they have, they have big, big, um, big expectations to, to fill after such a, after such a good first season. Okay. All right. Yeah. Everybody give a round of applause. Yeah, thank you and for indulging me. I'm pretty me. sure that was my punishment for putting you through my the 100 rant last week. <laughs> um, so I understand why you did what you did. Um, and it's it's we're even, right? We're okay. even. Yeah, we're even. Steve. Good. Yeah. Good. No, yeah. but that's pretty cool about how Michael's connected to Spock. I did not know that. Yeah. Um. But I'm sure that'll end up being an inner geekdom trivia question at one point, depending yes. on what occurs with the TV and cinematic universe of Star Trek. Yes. Uh, yes. Meanwhile, uh, on the showdown, Mike Kalinowski faces off against, what was her name? Um, I've really done my research tonight, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> she won the match, too, but That's I don't uh, remember her name. Mara Kopnothic? Mara Kanopic. I still don't like her. <laughs> well, it's she's, interesting. She's just so bland. I don't. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. What, why is it interesting? <laughs> well, it, it was interesting in that I think Kalinowski basically like groomed her to like be the person to take out like Cushing and some of these other folks. And at the end of the day, she's the one that ends up taking him out. See, I don't, I don't think he groomed her. He well, rigged the deck so that he knew he could make it to the final match. Yeah. And he claims that he did it purposely to give her a chance, but I don't, I don't view it as groomed. Well, maybe grooms, are, maybe grooms are wrong word, but I guess he, yeah, I mean, he was, yeah, I, I, maybe he was, maybe it was more. He thought she was going to be weak competition and. She would be strong enough that she could get through, but uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, he would just win and, and go to the to the finals. Uh, well, but, he he almost did. Yeah, he he had it completely in his favor, and then he screwed up. Yeah, and yeah. he didn't. He picked the wrong numbers, and she picked the right numbers, and and it just played out the way it did. He didn't yeah. have as far enough lead as he would have hoped to have. Yeah. Um, but it just, I don't, I just, there was, Mike is a very charismatic component and mm -hmm. I was watching the match and I'm like, this is a good match. Mm -hmm. I just feel like it's very one-sided, you know, it just, I wish she would engage more and I don't know if she's still sick. I don't know if this is just her persona. Well, um, I think it's her persona, but you're right, but you are right that. As far as the charisma meter, it's, um, there, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's like, I'm trying to think of like, it's like, it reminds me of like Winona Ryder and Beetlejuice as far as that character where it's just, I know it's like a reaching back to an old film, but just kind of like that. <laughs> I, had a, I had a dream about Beetlejuice this week. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe random segue. Yeah. No. I, I, um, I relate it to something that Ken Knapsack said on the podcast that Collider has out right now called Riley Around, and it's him and Mark Riley mm -hmm. talking about random topics. And they were talking about the Schmodown and how other YouTubers have gone to it and experienced it and afterwards would tell them they can't do that. Um, and, and Ken's point is like, there's a difference between somebody sitting down 
and just talking for the sake of it and having it be get recorded mm -hmm. versus somebody who's done stand up comedy mm -hmm. or is a natural entertainer and is just trying to not only not only win at the competition, but they also understand that they have a part to play. Yeah. And it's one thing if it's her part, it just doesn't work for me. Like there's a reasons why there is a reason why I like um, the Four Horsemen, and I like everything John Roca does, even though I kind of also think he can be foolish at times. Yeah. Um, but it's entertainment and team action. Like, they're a bunch of douches, but they're yeah, also right. just playing parts. Like, yeah. that's not who they really are. Right, right. So, so I just, I wish it was more there was more enthusiasm like this is a big deal like and also didn't you feel a bit robbed i mean we spent weeks watching these matches and yeah. then to have this big showdown and it just fell flat for me yeah i i really i honest i will say i was hoping how ask you make it do uh, i've really enjoyed the the shake up how well at least in inner geekdom how we over the last three weeks or so we've had some really strong compelling competitive matches mm -hmm. i was hoping that uh yeah to your point i mean he is very charismatic and he was a good showman and i was hoping he would you know get get to the finals and then lose <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. And then yeah yeah it's just kind of like yeah yeah it's like in this it, it feels like the season is incomplete yeah, it's just, I don't know, and I'm not looking forward to the big showdown because I really don't like um, the champion, Jason Inman. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. We'll see what, what happens. Yeah. You know, KO isn't over. KO never ends. Right, right. Um, uh, and then we always are going to have our typical update on the saga that is James Gunn being fired. Yep. Yeah. You, you, quote, you, you put it best this week. The mouse that roared. That's <laughs> that's what you wrote. Yes, but you still. But yeah, but when we were talking about it the other night, that's what you said. So I like I like I like what you said so much. I put it in the rundown. That's so sweet. I don't even remember saying that. <laughs> I, was, I was, I was, I totally. <laughs> Y'all, Sarah had a long week. <laughs> and we were doing this. I totally saw that and I'm like, oh, that's really clever. I wish I would have thought of that. Yeah, and it's your, it's your words. This is actually early, even, this wasn't even Friday night when we were trying to figure out what to talk about tonight. It was, Earlier in the week, I think we were, like, catching up on some stuff, and, yeah, you, you were, like, the, the mouse that roared. So I was like, ooh, I like that. So I, I bookmarked it. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so what did um, Batista say? Oh, he just – he uh, did a, a very sarcastic tweet, thanks, Disney, and then he uh, ended it with Maka. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, I I guess the only reason why I, I just figure one we could just finally put a nail in this, and I agree we should never talk about this again. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's taking it in another another direction. Um, uh, we um, yeah, I, I guess for for me why it's so interesting is uh, many of our many actors and, and performers are, are very, you know, politically active and stuff on social media and, um, you know, it, it, and, and also how we've talked about the bullying of actors and stuff. And, and this time the, the bullies, the bullies won yet again, and instead of, you know, but this time instead of, you know, Running, you know, Ruby Rose or Kelly Tran or somebody off of, of off a platform. This time they actually, you know, cost help to, well, put the nail in the coffin as far as someone's job, because obviously he, you know, he put them, he put, you know, James gonna put himself in a situation to begin with by saying the reprehensible stuff, but, you know, but by them digging these things up and. You know, and magnifying it to the level that a company like Disney actually, um, you know, pulled the plug on him. Uh, you know, 
they, you know, they, you know, they won. But I know we could also bring up Roseanne too. So I don't know. Um. Okay. So. So basically, wait. Okay. So it, it gets into what we were talking about last week about how the more the debate goes on in social media, the more stuff is going to come out, and mm-hmm. the more of this guy's image is going to be completely ruined. Right. Um, I, I agree with that. I, I think it was, but I also understand, like, it's, and I don't know how to articulate this because I didn't realize that this is what we were going to get into, but earlier this week I was looking into information about transparency and especially from leaders of an organization of a studio and in this new age of not, of knowledge and technology and information sharing, we, we have a constant demand for transparency, but right the realization is that there are ripples effects. Like you may learn things like you may think you want transparency until you get it. Yeah. And then you're, you're just stuck with so much crap that you never anticipated nor wanted to know, Mm -hmm. um, which really makes you double think. And, and then there's this whole thing about privacy. Like, is it really right to reveal so much information about people and to tarnish images and basically, kick them out of Hollywood or whatever. And I don't know what's going to happen with James Gunn. I, I don't know. I really stopped paying attention last week with this whole saga. Um, but hopefully I, I think he can make a comeback. Um, especially considering M night Shyamalan made a comeback yeah. and <laughs> yeah. he was in movie jail for good reason. Yeah. <laughs> Just a crappy filmmaker at times. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So, so you know, it's 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 a cycle, and it is. And um, Disney won, and it's it's hard to say, like hard, hard to qualify it as winning or losing because and there's so many different sides and perspectives on this. Yeah. Um, but it is something to consider. I was listening to a lot of roundtable discussions um, from actors and actresses. Um, T. True Hollywood reporter does these for Oscar season. Yeah. And they were talking about um, the Me Too movement mm-hmm. and its effect in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And I think it was Octavia Spencer who brought up a really good point. And I'm a bit biased about this point is that is that their industry is so unique because there is no HR department. Right. And if you don't have an HR department, then really there's nobody doing the checking mm-hmm. and that's why all of the scumbags get through. Yeah. And, and once you realize that, that makes it very so much more vulnerable to the people who are actually in the business, whether it's the cast, whether it's the crew or anyone in between, um, those are people's, that's why there's so much abuse of power. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I, I know we also uh, this week we tweeted out the article, you know, you read what from a bustle with the uh, women, lady, the actresses from Arrowverse, and they right. raised that very similar points in in that article, you know, in the in the Me Too era, um, how uh, before all, you know, Weinstein and everything, you really were at the were at the mercy of of scumbag producers and stuff, but because of uh, people coming out and disclosing things that happened to them. Um, they feel more, you know, actresses talked about how they feel more empowered to raise points that come in you know, and that, that happens at the workplace. And, and not only, you know, not only as far as harassment and those kind of things, but also, uh, just more empowered as professionals to, you know, advocate for, you know, doing more scenes together. I was reading, uh, I think, uh, uh, Juliana Arcave was talking about, but, you know, because of feeling more empowered and stuff, she, you know, she and Emily Vett Ricards went, you know, to the producers and said, Hey, you know, we like to do more scenes together because it's a very male dominated show. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. but, but because of Me Too and, and Time's Up and everything else, not only are the, the, you know, the good thing of it as far as driving this comeback out, uh, even though Chris Hardwick 
somehow managed to get back. Um, mm-hmm. But overall, uh, people are feeling more empowered in, in many levels, not only for um, reporting things, but also just on set and advocating for themselves and talking about pay equity and other things like that. So, I mean, it's a very good, it's a very good read and that folks should definitely check it out. Um, especially since, uh, I know our, our, our core listeners are, our Arrowverse fans. And, you know, of course, Candace Patton talks about her experiences in there as, as, as well. And, um, and then we have the folks, uh, you know, Katie Lotz and, and, um, and some members of, uh, Castle Legends of Tomorrow as well. So that, that go, definitely go check it out. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, um, I can't think of anything to add on to that that yeah. you didn't explain or, um, talk about. But I th- really what I see about that article is because I follow so many people when the Arrow fandom is there is a lot of weird takes on Stephen Amell and mm-hmm. his either non support or support of the female actresses who have been voicing their opinions. And there's been a lot of snarky remarks about, well, this is why one character gets highlighted and one character doesn't. I I don't buy into that. I really don't, Will, because we're dealing with shows that are called The Flash and Arrow. Right. Barry Allen and Oliver Queen are the, are the leads. Yep. I'm sorry. They are. It's their stories. And everybody else, no matter their race, no matter the sex, you they are supporting cast. They, exactly. And and so I really find it difficult to um to take offense when characters aren't given enough screen time or anything. Yeah. Granted these writers have 23 episodes and they set themselves up for that. It's like, come on, you're obviously not doing anything, but um, it's still very, very annoying to me, especially because Stephen Amell did put out a really good video right after all of, he let all of the actresses themselves put out their statements. Mm -hmm. And then he went back around and he did his, and I believe Grant did his, yeah. quickly following that. And I think there's a point in that. Mm-hmm. Like some men can view that as a delayed, but I didn't because I didn't he wanted them to speak up first. Yep. Yep. And they touch on that as far as in that article, the bustle article talks on how the actresses feel that men that are, are, are allies and not adversaries mm-hmm. in, in, in this effort. And, uh, and I think you're, you're a hundred percent right. It was very smart you know, tactically and, and the right thing to do to let the actresses speak first before they said anything. And I think they were, I think both Grant and Steven, uh, said very, very powerful, um, you know, in their own way, um, remarks to what was, what was transpiring, uh, you know, after the whole Christberg situation. Yeah. And I think we're going to get a lot of female, love within the next year with Batman Batwoman coming. Yeah. So yeah. we got a lot of things in store, a lot of wrongs made right. I yeah. Say. Yeah. And also with that Swartz taking over a showrunner on Arrow and, uh, you know, and their writer's room being completely uh, revamped uh, as well. And uh, I know one of the other things and I, we can, we can, you know, close all of this topic, but uh, I know Candace and, you know, you were mentioning seeing some of the things on the various fandoms. And, uh, I know one of the things that, uh, does come up, I see quite a bit with fandom is, uh, with, with Candace, uh, being a woman of color and, mm-hmm. uh, and the lack of still relative lack of diversity in the flash writers room. And, uh, and, you know, you're adding two more women of color to the, the flash regular, right. uh, but you don't have that, uh, voice in the writer's room that you do on screen. And, and I know she was advocating, uh, you know, she mentioned, she made a note of that in, in the article. And, uh, and, and, and people make note of that every day online too. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we'll see some more opportunities behind the camera. Um, uh, especially in the, as we've seen with the successes of Black Panther and, you know, Crazy Red Asians. Um, mm-hmm. 
you know, representation is, is definitely uh, matters and uh, hopefully you know, more opportunities are able to become into to good people of all, all stripes uh, and, and, you know, in front of and behind the camera. Right. Right. And I, I didn't know that, um, but I think that's an excellent point that she brought up in that article because writers control the story and it's important to have that diversity in the writer's room because to get all of the perspectives on these issues and a a white man isn't going to be able to tell Iris's West story as long as she is an African American woman. Yeah. Like yeah. it just doesn't translate like that. Okay. It's probably a reason why she hasn't been um to what's the newspaper called? Uh Central City News. That's how long it's been, people. Yeah. We can't even can't. really remember yeah. <laughs> the newspaper's name. See? But speaking about The Flash, you know, it's really crazy. I think I know more about what's going on with The Flash Season 5 than I do with Arrow Season 7 right now. Yeah, yeah. I think they have, I don't know if it's an intentional thing or, or what, but... Uh, more info has been seems to be being put out by by the Flash. Yep, this week we got they dropped um, the titles mm-hmm. of the first six episodes, and we have Nora, of course, yep. episode one, mm-hmm. then Blocked, then the Death of B- Vibe, Newsflash, All Dolled Up, and the Icicle Comets. Yeah, so. The third title was something that uh, the folks um, we kind of got teased about that one a couple about a week or so ago because uh, Candace on her uh, Instagram posted a picture of a uh, funny picture of just Hartley Sawyer and, and Star Labs and in the background it, we could see Bob duh and you could look pretty clear you know folks are you know zooming in there it looks Bob dead. Like it was a headline of of um, an article, and uh, so once that title uh, was dropped this week, uh, folks, yeah, you know, obviously, and we'll and I know we'll we'll get to our our deeper Arrowverse uh, prediction show as we get closer to the uh, season starting, but um, yeah, folks, we're, we're definitely trying to figure out what's going to happen to to to, to, to uh, Cisco and, and Vibe and. You know, obviously, folks were worried that Carlos is leaving the show. I mean, I, I saw it all. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. I just, I just wish that the next episode wasn't called New Slash. It was called Revived. Yeah. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I see what you did there. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> He's gonna revive at the end of that episode. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, yeah. I don't, I don't trust the Flash. You know, I. They, even Arrow Mm. tried, and they're not sneaky at all about this, okay? A lot of people predicted Laurel Lance's death, Mm -hmm. Arrow Season 4. Spoiler alert. I'm really, really sorry I spoiled that. Not really. I... And they tried because they they blacked out not only the headline of the episode, but also the one right afterwards. Yeah. Um, they they had her on set a lot and they did all of these kind of things. And everybody's like, no, we still know she's dead. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> so I just I don't I don't see them willing, especially this early in hiatus. To to still or this soon in hiatus to drop that as it feels much more like a tease that they're probably not gonna follow through on. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I figured is something's you know given that Cicada has this mission of taking out Meadows. Um, I think it's uh, we wanted to, have to do something, and I know it's like shot. Echoes of the foe, but I think it's, you know, will be where he loses his powers or something like that, but I don't think he ends up being, you know, killed or, or may have something to do with why Nora came back. Maybe he was killed in the alternate timeline and, and that was the thing that she messed up and, and. That's an excellent point because yeah. it's the death of the vibe. It's not the death of Cisco. Right. So, so that, that makes sense. 
The, I also hear speculation that Wally West is pretty much a goner in either the first or second episode this season, so I don't see them doing back-to-back deaths like that. Right, right. And actually, he is slated to do three episodes this season. Oh, I'm sorry. So it's really the death of Wally West. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I don't, I don't know. They don't say it. Who it, will it, not get revived? But right, but I don't know if it's three all at the beginning or if it's going to be three, you know, spread out over the course of the season. So we shall see. No, I'm, I'm not going to add to what you just said because you stepped on my joke. Okay? <laughs> I'm it sorry. was a great joke. It was. It was. I'm stepped sorry. On it. I'm sorry. Um, I I foresee a potential Felicity Smoke coming over. For all dolled up, yep. uh, Iris West, West Felicity Smoke team up, and then of course, if I swear, well, if the icicle cometh is not directed by Kevin Smith, I'm gonna be pissed yeah. because that's a Killer Frost episode, and he does Killer Frost the best. He does, he does, and he, I, I think I think he is slated to come back and direct season in season five. five. Of course, yeah, it's just a matter <laughs> of where he slotted, yeah. That's one of the best things that they ever did on The Flash. I mean, his his energy and his persona alone gets viewers. And yeah. it's like, why would a movie filmmaker want to do a TV show? And it's because he loves these characters. So yeah. I say bring them back for a few episodes every year. Definitely, definitely. Um. So, so yeah, and, you know, I tried looking up a few titles of Arrow season seven and I, I couldn't find very many, There's, you know, yeah, it's still very unknown how long he'll actually be in jail for season seven. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about a, a third of the season. Yeah. Which is a long time. It is a long time. And you know, and you know why I, I'm pretty sure it has to do with, they have to have that, Oliver Queen comic book goatee mm-hmm. by the time he gets out of jail. Yep. Because then he's immediately going to shape it. Yep. 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 You got yep. it. Yep. You know that. You know that. Yep. Uh, revived. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I'm, I wish you used that for like our audio man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Thinking about revived. Christian Slater yeah. had an interview with Collider this week, and he talked about the potential future end of Mr. Robot. Well, this is why hiatus is dragging on. I have not been teased with a Mr. Robot season four trailer nor release date, and I'm getting very frustrated. I am too. Um, because it's it's been a long time since I've been able to talk Mr. Robot. I can't even really remember where we left off, even though I remember perfectly. And I just, you know, it didn't shock me when he put this on the rundown because Sam Esmail has always said either four or five seasons. Mm-hmm. So, and, and they still go back and forth on really if it is the last one or if they're going to do a season yeah. four is part one. So five episodes. Yeah. And then five more, and I'm just like, rip off the band aid and drop them all at once. Yeah, yeah. Well, Robbie yeah. was he was asked about Christian's comments, and he was like, oh, really? <laughs> that, that was, I, you know, he he was. He, I don't know if he was being sarcastic or what, but you know, because it's hard to tell in print. But uh, he was like, well, it is his birthday, so I had to text him about it. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we've. I think the plan was all. Was to do what four or five seasons, as you said, and yeah. there's been nothing. I mean, there, there's been a lot of chatter that, about Sam Smell's other projects. I mean, he's got the uh, uh, new um, series that's going to be on on USA. Um, what's it called again? Um, the oh, Julia Roberts one. Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, I thought that was an Amazon Prime original. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is Amazon. I don't. I don't know. I think it's partly because of like Sam Esmail is now highly in demand for yeah. writing projects, and everything. He, he's a brand name now. Okay, mm-hmm. he's he's made his name like you can't. It's not Mr. Robot. It's Sam Esmail's Mr. Robot, which which is very powerful for anyone 
show running because you don't get that a lot. Uh, Kurt Sutter comes to mind because of his um, fame when it came to Sons of Anarchy. Right, right. At the same time, though, Sam Esmail even said he wanted this to be a movie. He did. And then he, they, they, um, he felt like there was more story to tell, so he he stretched it, and before he knew it, he made a few seasons, and and even now, you know, season two especially, you could tell they were kind of stretching the story a little bit further. So yeah. if it ends this season, I'll be fine. If it ends a season later, I'll be fine. I just want another season. I, yeah, it's just. I know, yeah, I, I want another season. I know that there's going to be a, there's going to be a comic book that uh, will be issued um, based on Mr. Robot. I think it, you know, I haven't seen much, again, just like the show itself, is I haven't seen much other than speculation. I mean, some of the speculation is that it'll, it'll be a, a prequel where it gets into the, the background of how Elliot created F Society. Yeah, I, I'm like you. I want a show. I mean, and, and, and reading Christian's inter, you know, interview with Collider, and he was like, you know, talking about, yeah, the writer's room is getting together, kicking around stuff. But at the end of the day, they need to get things moving because the one, you, you're right, the show you know, had such a stellar start. Second season dropped off. Third season ratings are also dropping off. So it's going to hit a point where. I mean, USA is not going to, you know, cancel this show because it is such a, you know, Sam is a, as you said, he is a brand now. But at the same time, it's just like you're stringing the fans along and we're just, we're just like, you know, we're like, you know, folks in the desert wanting water. <laughs> Please yeah. yeah. And it's also a very dense show. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot. And when you allow the hyenas to drag on too long, yeah. you allow your viewers to lose yeah. stakes. Yes. And um, just just overall need to watch the show because, yeah. oh, well, now I have 15 other things like we, we're dealing with the market. Yeah. And there is a new show every month or so. Yeah. yeah. Granted, half of them suck. True. But yeah. <laughs> but I mean. You never know what's going to suddenly replace Mr. Robot. And um, I know that I'm still all in. I just, you know, I, I'm tired of of will it this be then or not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just want to finish the story and how it was meant to be told, and I hope that we get that far soon. Yeah, it's me too. Me too. Why did you put this on the rundown, Will? I have nothing to say about this. Jason Bourne spinoff show ordered for USA. I just thought it was <laughs> interesting. <laughs> I'm like, you're like, it's interesting. To who, Will? To you. To me, yes, yes. And maybe a couple of listeners, you know. But, no, I, it, yeah, it's just, um, it was a, hiat a little note from hiatus. Nothing that's going to, it was ordered for by USA. Um, it it sort of, I, I guess I was still, you know, charged up or whatever from our, our previous discussions on Bond and Mission Impossible and, 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 and you know, Bourne uh, falls into into that genre, so I was like, yeah, I, I was I was intrigued by this uh, this uh, this announcement and yeah, and and the with the Bourne series, it looks like it's going to uh, be um, part of the uh, Treadstone, which was the CIA program for sleeper agents and stuff that uh, Jason Bourne was a part of. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, I doubt Matt Damon will, will, will come over from movies to television and do it, but he's also said he would be cool if, if it is Jason Bourne in this, he said he's cool with another actor playing the character. So, uh, but more likely than not, it's still be a true spinoff and probably we'll get, you know, we'll, we'll have another entry in the Borneverse. Um, like we did with Jeremy Renner and and um, with the uh, Bourne film that he did. Yeah. Okay. So I, I stopped watching Jason Bourne after like the third one. Okay. Um, and I yeah. don't know why my voice is cracking right now. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're just so choked up because the one with Jeremy Renner just did movie. Yeah. <laughs> right, and then the recent one. I didn't see the recent one yeah. either. Um. 
But this does lead me to something I have been debating because I have graciously, no, (laughs) (laughs) Um, I have endured a lot of talk about Mr. Bond, Mm -hmm. James Bond, uh, Mr. Bourne and Mission Impossible, Ethan Hunt. Mm -hmm. See, that's how much I watched that franchise. I even was like. Mission yeah. Impossible. Let hey, me think I, about I feel, it. I, 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 I feel touched <laughs> that you that you remember the, the name of the of Tom Cruise's character. <laughs> you got me. Yep, yep. I took my time and I found the answer. No need for multiple choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but and and it's and I go back and forth. It's not like I despise um action films because i remember watching some when i was younger mm-hmm. we used to watch a lot of the, like the lethal weapon movies mm-hmm. um my dad was in a die hard um a die hard fan for, so that wasn't in and i know that's like anarchy um because that apparently is the best 80 movies of all any yeah, yeah 80s yeah, yeah. movies of all time yeah yeah, yippee ki yeah. But it's just, I don't, I don't know what it is. And then I was thinking about, okay, so why does it feel like action movies are not, yeah, we have the, the regular franchises mm-hmm. these days, but it's not the same. And I think it's because of all of the comic book movies and just the comic book drama that I get enough action in those films. Mm-hmm. That I don't need anything less than, um, because watching an action film to me, when I try, all I see is, well, this is a superhero movie, but it's not a superhero movie. Mm -hmm. And these guys don't actually have powers and there isn't a connected universe, even though they claim to be connected. Yeah. And they just have a lot more budget than they did before. (laughs) So let me ask you, are you a fan of the Fast and Furious franchise? I own the first movie because I liked the first movie. And and I've tried to watch the one where Paul Walker dies. Mm -hmm. Like, not in the movie, out of the movie. I didn't care for it. And I didn't really understand. Like, I know why it's a big deal. I get it. I'm not completely non-human. I just, I didn't really care for the story because it felt utterly ridiculous. Yeah. There were two towers and they jumped from one tower to another tower in a car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because I'm not a big, you know, even though I've mentioned these other franchises, I'm not a big fan of the Fast and Furious franchise. So, Saving grace, Will. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I get a, I get a plus mark tonight from you. <laughs> so. Still in the negatives, but yep. <laughs> Continue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, no, but when you, when you put this as a, as, a, as a rundown, the difference between action films and, and comic book films, I really, I, I you know, I had to, I thought about it quite a bit, actually. And um, especially... Because I mean, I, you you raised like the '80s films like Lethal Weapon and mm-hmm. Die Hard, and I think the similarities that I see with those films and say the MCU, which I almost will put the MCU in a category of itself for comic book films, mm-hmm. uh, because they the reason and the reason why I say that is. Uh, Whereas other comic book films prior to this were, and it maybe started with, well, it really started with the Christopher Nolan Batman, I would think. Um, yeah. With, with the with the serialized storytelling. Right. Um, and then MCU took it and just took it to another level. Um, prior to that, comic book movies were generally standalone projects. Uh, obviously Superman, the 1978 Superman with Christopher Reeve and Superman 2 really, you know, were the catalyst for, you know, taking these films from B-movie, cheesy, bad special effects to, you know, major blockbuster status. But the thing that, to get back to my earlier point, the thing that I see 
similarities between the 80s films with Die Hard and Lethal Weapon and the current crop of comic book films is you had characters that you could really get emotionally invested in. Yeah, and and I think it actually, what you said before about the serialization, um, like those action movies, the classic ones of the 80s and the 90s, did feel like they would get a sequel, Mm -hmm. but then the sequel was the new take. And I feel like the action movies that we are currently getting hits the same beats any time that there's a sequel. Mm -hmm. The big difference is that the fight scenes scenes hopefully are better and there's more action. Mm -hmm. Um, But there isn't as much character development. There isn't, it, it isn't about a legacy or a mantle or humans human stories because mm-hmm. I always view superheroes as and the comic book genre as the mythology mythology of our time. Yeah, like it is. of the twentieth century. Yeah. And and that's why these stories work and can translate into virtually any medium mm-hmm. is because uh, like when we were watching Cloak and Dagger, they had the episode about the hero's journey and mm-hmm. they broke down that whole arc and to mirror what the characters were going through, that arc is applied in all of these stories, whether it's in the MCU, the DCEU, mm-hmm. or all that came before. The arc of an action movie just is the same beats yeah. told in a different way, maybe with a few different characters. And it's, it's usually driven by one person and it just so happens to typically always be a man as yeah. well. It is. Yeah. So, so I just, and, and yes, they have their own mantle and everything. And an argument can be say, um, said that there is a, a mantle that is a legacy driven, but it's not the same, and I don't feel as connected to it, um, and it doesn't feel as vast as um, a comic book movie does. It doesn't right. feel as, like, global. Yeah. Um, even though they're always trying to save the world, yeah. it just feels like a few people can, very small niche club, who just right. happen to know the same guy. Yep, <laughs> they're the same guy, and, yeah, they were all, they were, they they either they were uh, the trope is they were buddies together in special forces, or or they were you know ex you know they maybe play a ball together you know some some kind of macho tie that you know it's that they get paired together um, and yeah but but there is there is that lack of character development in those films and and I think that's and, and, and it's just basically you know, the, the the action sequences as far as like what can we do stunt wise to top what we did in the previous film uh, as far as the action film and uh, it's it's I think that at its core because yes there is action and all the outstanding you know outrageous and stunts and stuff that we see in in the MCU and other comic book films, but I feel like the modern comic book film, the, and, it, and it, in particular the successful modern comic book films, like <laughs> Superman and the MCU and the Batman trilogy, at, at its core, what made these films work for it was the character and the character development. And yes, it, and it's built around all these fantastic things happening at the same time. But, you know, you've seen other comic, you know, you've seen these characters in other vehicles where, um, they don't take the time to do a, as great character development and it falters. I mean, you look at Spider-Man 3. I mean, Spider-Man 1 and 2 by Sam Raimi did, did the right things as far as building character development. But mm-hmm. by 3, it was just a hot mess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a hot mess. Yeah. I, yeah, I think it just, I, I feel like it, filmmakers who really understand just the filmmaking medium, um, 
because Christopher Nolan took over the Batman fr- franchise and re- revived it mm-hmm. <laughs> from <laughs> um, movie jail, because yeah. that's what happened in the 90s. That yep. character it mm-hmm. just fell apart. It mm-hmm. became gimmicky. It became it about selling toys. And yep. it just wasn't what anybody cared or wanted to see. And And Nolan brought a maturity to it. Yeah. And a groundedness and a darkness. Mm-hmm. Granted, now all DCEU movies have to be dark and grounded. And but but what they failed to realize is that in the groundedness, they he didn't use CGI all over the place. Yes, yes, exactly. And again, it goes back to my point. It's about the character. Yeah, and and I feel like for for me. Beyond just the character, I feel like it's about that filmmaker who's guiding it. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have the MCU without Kevin Feige. We wouldn't. Like, no. Yeah. And and he's not even directing these movies. He's just the man above that, that studio head who who has his fingers on everything, but is not also pulling too many strings at once. He He... He has a patience with this mm-hmm. um, that I think is very needed to do what he is doing. Yeah. And and so there's it's but but to get back to why I did put it on the rundown is because this is my explanation for why when these movies, action movies are brought up that I don't really get enthusiastic about it is because I get all of my action with this comic book genre. I, when we talk about those movies, mm-hmm. I can criticize stunts. I get my action on weekly comic book TV shows. Yeah. And, and so I don't need that. Instead, I want to, when I'm not watching something comic book related, I want to do the opposite and check out some rom-coms, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you have Work. To. Or cry on This Is Us, which yeah. you've been watching. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's good to change up. It's good to change up. Yeah. And yeah. we we all have our little our little collection of the things we like and need in our um on our remote control. All right. Well all right. well I think we got through it all tonight. Yes we did. Why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you? Yes, you can find me at Will M. Polk. That's W-I-L-L-M-P-O-L-K. You can find me at S.J. Belmont, S-J-B-E-L-M-O-N-T. Follow our crew on Twitter at Scene and Nerd. Friend us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. But most importantly, rate, subscribe, and comment on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Good night. Geek out. You're welcome. <laughs>